Let me start recording. Okay, cool. There we go. All right, and we are recording. Um, We're recording just as Michael disappears from the video. <laughs> Leave yeah, us. Well, to... <laughs> whenever I look at a different thing, it automatically does that. So um, I was trying to look at the document, but anyway. Um, okay, I'll I'll do my update real quick. So for the last few weeks, I've been um, basically porting over. Um, the UNIXFS implementation to um, this new generic stuff that we've been talking about and working on as like a way to dog food it and figure out what, what we need and what we don't need. Um, and so that's been going pretty well. It's brought those implementations really far along and there's a really active branch uh, in UNIXFS that's about halfway there in terms of moving support along. Um, so that's like most of what I've been into. Oh, and I wrote the generic spec up as well, which is like, I'm not super happy with the spec, actually, after talking to Eric in particular, like just a, a huge amount of it is very specific to how we'll implement this in JavaScript and in WebAssembly. Um, and so I think I might break off like maybe half of it into a document that is just about the WebAssembly side of things. That's me. Who's next? Um, I don't think I have the right crypt pad open, but that's okay. So, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about the, the generic C stuff, which I think is the artist formerly known as advanced layouts. Um, and I just pasted some new gist. This probably belongs as either an issue or turning into a PR or something, but I'm still, there's a bunch of to-dos in it. So I copied and pasted it into the GIST in the last 60 seconds before the call started. Um, sorry, sorry, which, what was this for? Identifying the critical decisions in IPLD advanced data structure and generic design. Oh, okay, there's a link now. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I can't paste links in Zoom. It's on a different, it's hard. So if you're doing it in the IPLD yeah. channel, I'm not on Slack, I'm not caught up there because of your massive discussion overnight. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, like that discussion sort of lands us at the document that he's writing up that he's sort of, okay. so it's maybe yeah. better just get to the end. <laughs> um, so the, the key part of this in progress write up is um, going back to determining all of the critical decisions that need some thought as we do this um, advanced data and generic stuff and trying to give those a couple of of names and consider like how many of these things are orthogonal to the others and like, you know, make progress mm -hmm. that way. So I think some of this is stuff we've actually talked about in person before in a smattering of times and I'm just trying to like put names on it and get it on paper now. Mm -hmm. um, so the names I'm going to suggest are, we have the signaling problem, the referencing problem, and the having the implementation problem. So signaling is just the question of like when we need to get any of our advanced data management stuff in action at all. Um, referencing is the problem of how do we refer to a particular system for advanced data manipulation. And then having the implementation is where we get into like, okay, what what is WASM? How do we hash WASM? How do we refer? How do we get other code if there's a native implementation? How do we connect? all of those dots, mm -hmm. which is slightly different than the referencing problem, just because um, when we get to concretely having the implementation, then we get, I mean, it's where the, the, the rubber hits the road. Is that an act uh, thing? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think like, um, I'd, I'd like to change signaling to like self-description um, because I think that it's a question of like whether or not these are self-describing or not. Um, to me at least, and then if they're not self-describing, if we sort of cut that, like what we were calling indent signaling, then you effectively like skip to the second point, right? Um, so I, just, just to interject, sorry, this is a little bit of a distraction, but I did, uh, I did put some of the notes from the our Berlin meeting into, they still in a pull request in the IPLD repo, and mm -hmm. I did have the, the three these three, this is where you first started outlining those three problems, but they've got different names there. If you scroll down to, uh, 
just search for signaling actually in that the document there. So that's the history of. Issue. Uh, he just sent the P he just put the PR in Zoom. I'll, um, so in Slack chat though. Oh, okay. Pull request number 72. Um, okay. So I, I want to get into this uh, in, a, in a longer discussion, but first I, I, I'd like to get Rod's update. Come back around to it. Yeah. Oh, oh, before we get that though, Eric, um, I know you also made some progress on collectors, but I just want to get a quick update on that. Oh, um, I have closed all those tabs. Context switching is brutal. Um, so, yeah, selectors continue to be fun. Um, I'm still, I'm still needing to write a bunch more about that. Um, the bar to clear before we get like a coherent PR out of it that's worth review of a bunch of people is like really quite high. So, mm -hmm. um, in trying to to figure out how to make progress on that, you probably saw that I posted a comment on the PR that I have outstanding right now, which basically says, don't review this anymore. Um, there are more drafts yet. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I'm sitting here with like, um, five different drafts on my local host and some of them haven't actually like reached the escape velocity where I've prepared them to be individually PR'd and I kind of don't want to spam people in that way either. So what I'm trying to do now is create like a systemic review of all of the different directions that have gotten at least a little exploration. Um, we've gone from like the, the three older drafts that are all in issues um, then in the recent generation, since um, Volker and I have been working on iterating it together, we came up with one of the flat stack, then there was another iteration that was a recursive draft. There's mm -hmm. been two or three of those, which are like slowly sussing out some more issues. Um, the most mm -hmm. recent ones that I've been trying to work on are separating explorer versus matcher concepts. So one of them is a bit like the where clause in SQL, and the other is a bit more like the select clause itself. And... Um, trying to figure out how to get that to recurse correctly and smoothly and pleasingly has been really tricky. Um, there's all sorts of questions like, what if I want to explicitly match and get a callback on a node that's in the middle of an exploration that's going to continue? Um, so trying to figure out how to make that feel good has been really, really fiddly and tricky. Um, so, I think most of the problems there are now identified. It's just a matter of figuring out how to make all of this look good. Um, one of the most recent good ideas I had somebody else feed me during um, some conference times was um, maybe trying to hoist the idea of named matches from regexes and use that sort of um, concept for how to indicate a match versus an explorer, and that might make some stuff look good. Still working on that thought. Um, I do like named groups in regexes. We don't have them in JavaScript, but yeah, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Um, so you can so you can so you can name something far down in your selector, and then hoist that name and reference it somewhere else for more advanced use. Yep. Yeah. So I think that might be a cool idea. Um, and we can, yeah, I don't know. That one still needs a little more iteration. Um, a couple of the more complicated examples I've been throwing at myself over this time have also started to make a little sense with that. It turns out, I think the latest draft now has um, Explorer and Matcher concepts started getting closer to each other again, and maybe they'll be the same because the Matcher is just when you add a name to it. Um, but then instead, there's now a another subsection of the schema that's all about conditionals for the case where we want to have an explorer that like looks at a field that's a little bit deeper before it decides whether or not it wants to explore it, which wasn't really supported in any of the earlier drafts. Um, so I think that I think that feature is going to make Stephen happy, for starters. Um, there's a couple of other like applications I have that it seems to be in use for, for. like if you have a, an array and you want to recurse into objects in the array, but only when their like name property is set to foobar or something like this, 
Um, that's a pretty common case that I think we need support for and the new conditional thing might get that. Um, yep, but so that's, now that is still stuck in the, the hell of rough drafts on my computer that need to get advanced to the point that they can be a real boy PR. So work continues. Awesome, awesome. One thing um, we shouldn't talk about it now, but we should like sort of put the thought out there and think about it long term is like how we calculate and describe the cost of particular selectors um, and how we calculate that as you go along. Because we we don't have any of the nice things that you get out of like SQL systems and GraphQL to do this up front. So <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we'll be able to build things like that. Like we can have, um, one of the concepts that's turned out to be important when trying to implement these is high cardinality versus low cardinality matchers. I forget if I've described that in our IPL. Yeah. Before. I think I did maybe yeah. at the, the other graph sync meeting. Mm -hmm. The idea that some things are basically going to require a full table scan, if you will, and other things will allow jump to subsets. Right, right. So yeah, we'll have some structure for reasoning about those, but. There's some overlap there um, too with the uh, the collection stuff, right? Because we have operations that you do on collections, and those are how you perform a lot of those skip operations when we get into multi-block stuff. Um, for instance, if you do like a range query, like a like a range subset rather than like um, than like a pattern match, um, that's a difference between a full scan and like a, a a much more efficient operation. But we need to like have that operation enabled in the collection stuff to so actually be efficient. Um, so we don't actually have, I guess this is yet another thing that we could add. Um, none of the drafts I'm holding on to right now have range selections for like map keys. They have range mm -hmm. selection for lists by index. And that's kind of easy and obvious how you long jump into the middle of it. Right. Well, it, it is, but we also need to describe that method in the list collection stuff so that you can do it as a multi-block collection. Right. Yeah. I think it's in there. Like, it's just, you know, we need to make sure that we're, we're mapping this together. Um, and um, I don't know if, like, there, there's some questions that we need to answer in the future. Like, if you get a map um, that's unordered, so it doesn't have a range thing in it, or, or you get an, an array for that matter. Like, say you get a list and it doesn't have an ability to do slices on it, you can only iterate over the full thing. Um, do we actually implement the slicing or do we just say like, no, you can't, right? Um, anyway, okay, um, Rod, you're up. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sorry, I'm just taking my, putting my notes down. Um, it's so two weeks. I've, um, the main thing has been integrating the hash map slash hamped into JS types, Michael's new thing. Um, so the, 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 the interesting thing I'm inter iterating on there is trying to keep the algorithm of a collection completely abstracted from the way you interface with it. So that we can have the idea being that we can have these pluggable algorithms that have a defined way of interfacing and the algorithms don't get need, don't need to get so deeply messed up and uh, mixed up in what we're what we're implementing to traverse them. Um, so, you know, just aiming for more pluggability, um, and that's leading to some interesting changes in my original assumptions. Um, and the the biggest one being the traversal, uh, the block by block traversal. Uh, it, originally, the way I built it was, you would give it a way to get new blocks. So you'd say, here's how you get new blocks when you need them. And I've replaced that with a, um, a traversal that just does one block and then stops and says, look, I've done this block, but if you want me to continue, then you'll have to give me a new block identified by this thing. And it's up to you whether I continue or not. Um, so it's this, it's just breaking down the algorithm into how to traverse a block. Um, and then it's up to the, the interfacer to decide how far to keep going. Um, and that's coming up with some interesting APIs. I've got a hash map slash, I'm, just, I'm calling it a hash map. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just done with hamped, okay? I'm, <laughs> I've got a hash map spec. Um, it does say that it's a hamped, but it doesn't say that in the title. Um, and it's, it's nearly complete. I, I'll probably, I would expect I'll have it in today. 
um, I nearly finished it on Friday, but I, I, as I got into discussion of the designs, design decisions, I started second guessing some of the choices that were being made. Um, but I think instead of making major proposals for change, I'll just go ahead with what I've got and flag uh, at the bottom of it, potential future areas for research. So right now what I've got is very similar to what Jeremy originally put in his spec. Um, so there's, it's not, it shouldn't be too controversial. Um, so it shouldn't be, I, I don't imagine it's going to be hugely difficult to get to consensus on it, but there's, there's definitely area f areas for research in how these things perform and whether some of the decisions we've made are appropriate. Um, and I just don't think we know until we, do that research and I don't think that research is going to be done anytime soon. So let's put that off into the future and take the best guess now. And then one day I'm sure we'll have people coming along using these things, doing research and saying, Hey, these decisions you've made are poor. Um, so, you know, we may as well flag them now and they're interesting areas to pursue into the future. So that's what I'm, that's mainly what I'm doing. Um, and the other thing I have been doing is, getting into other data structures. I'm really keen to get onto sorted collections. Um, I've been toying with the idea of, um, so I, I, I'm most interested at the moment in, in red black trees and AVL trees. And I, I think, I think you can come up with an algorithm that actually does both because like a red black tree can be an AVL tree and vice versa. Um, there's just got slightly different rules, but the difficulty with those the collections is in, how they would span blocks. So where are the block boundaries? Because if you did one block per node, you'd end up with lots of tiny little nodes, which would just be garbage. So um, I've been thinking about the possibility of packing um, a bunch of nodes into a single block and then ha just having a boundary where, um, you know, you get to a certain layer and then it has to hop out of the blocks. And so what is the algorithm for deciding how to do that packing? What, what, how do you decide where those boundaries are. I think that's, that's probably the most difficult challenge with these collections. Otherwise the algorithms I think are relatively straightforward. Um, but again, it's one of those things that you're making really potentially big trade-offs and you just don't know where those trade-offs are good without really in-depth research. So I've got to draw a line somewhere about how much research I do versus just getting to something that works. But um, that's that's what I anticipate doing for in the near future, um, depending on how Michael's stuff evol evolves and how much I have to get involved in that. That's me. Um, awesome. We want to get back to the discussion about yeah yeah um, slash data structures. I, I think thought. one thing. Oh, go ahead. Um, a thing riffing off of Rob's collection work before we go back to that thing. Um, I just realized that in my brain, I get a little bit crosswired sometimes thinking about order preserving collections versus order randomizing collections versus sorted collections. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think that two of those are interchangeable and they're kind of not. So I tried to deal with some of that in the, in that um, collections, multi-block collections doc in the specs repo. And I had a, like a three, a three by two table. Um, and it's got those three things. There's the completely random, there's the ordered by construction and ordered by key, I think I called them. Um, and they're, they're all three are really useful. And I think we're going to have to end up with all three. And I think, like Michael's done some really basic work on an order by construction one, but you need to have the data up front to encode it. Um, Jeremy, I think is working on something at the moment was Sh Charay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. Which would also presumably, well, with arrays, it's less of a, yeah. I guess you've thought about these words before. I just realized that I have a brain where I often confuse them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's fair enough. Yeah, I mean, you just you have to pick completely different structures in different cases. Like there are big trade-offs for a lot of them. Um, like after I built the, this array implementation that you just need it all up front, I realized like if you know that you need all the data up front, you can make it really efficient. <laughs> like, um, you know, hmm. and 
all the operations in it are incredibly efficient and you don't have to do scans ever. So um, there are really big advantages to doing things that way um, when that's accessible. And in the case of Unix FS, we, we effectively like always have to do it that way for like a chunked, for like a, a big piece of chunked binary. And we stick that into a multi-block array. Um, we always have all the data up front. Like you, you always re-chunk the whole data structure. You don't like have a chunk of data that you're comparing <laughs> against the rest of them, right? Like first you chunk it all up and hash map it, and then you compare it. <laughs> um, so yeah. I, I, the, the other challenge with this is that most people don't think about those distinctions. They just reach for something that works for their use case. And I, I remember doing this as a, as a sort of beginner to intermediate Java programmer. Um, with this really good collections library, but without understanding the, the distinction between all the types, you just reach for what works. And that, that means that, and, and most, most programmers do, and that means that the implementers of the standard library have this challenge of making those convenient types performant in all those ways that people are using them, which is a real challenge. And so you end up with these um, one or two collections that everyone's using for all these different things and they're trying to optimize them for all those use cases, which is a huge challenge, but it leads to some very sophisticated algorithms that can do serve multiple purposes. Um, and that's why I think the Java collections library is a rich source of these algorithms because of that challenge. But it also points to the challenges for us as implementers of essentially an API that people are gonna use when a, a lot of our users are not gonna care or even want to understand the, the distinction between them. So we have to give them things that just work and then cross our fingers, they're going to work for their use case. I mean, well, on a long enough timeline, I do think that a lot of those decisions get covered up by higher yeah. order APIs though, right? Yeah. Like even looking at the, the thing that I just did, um, the, the one that I just did, the, that array, like nobody actually creates that array directly right now. Like you have a chunked binary type that uses that when the set is big. <laughs> and so like, and it knows that like that is being, like it knows the use case for the sort of chunked binary type. Um, and it knows that it lends itself well with that data structure, right? So it sort of uh, covers up that decision and says like, oh, you know, for my data structure, that's definitely gonna be the right thing. So even at this low level, you're already seeing um, some, some disintermediation between the, the implementations of these uh, and the people actually picking up the one. Yeah, but the challenge of good API design is making sure that, um, yeah you defer that process whereby somebody in the future has to come along and uncover all of those layers to figure out why their stuff isn't performing. Um, like right. the work that yeah. I did for IPLD, JS IPLD, IPFS, which, is, which was really was that process. Let's look through all these layers and see where all the bad decisions were made. And it turns out that there are all the layers. <laughs> so let's try and defer that as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, right. Like, I mean, we can have a common read interface and make it easy to read all these different data structures regardless of how they were created, but there are going to be performance trade-offs in that in those read operations, and you're going to see them at scale. So, um, okay. So uh, let's come back to this document real quick. Um, so w one thing I, I want to kind of make clear up front, I do see all the work that we're doing right now as something of a stopgap on the way to this being in WebAssembly. Like it is not tenable long-term to be configuring the implementation of every one of these data structures um, and having all this. So like um, sort of, to, you know, referencing and having the implementation, like our goal is to actually get rid of those, like making those not a thing, not a factor. Like it is just built into the system that like it knows how to go and look these up, um, assuming that they are like within the network. Um, so yeah, like that, and that's one of the reasons why the self-description mechanism is so important because eventually the self-description mechanism will be enough to do everything else, right? You won't have to do, you won't have to layer on knowing how the implementation of the You'll actually just be able to, like the system will just be able to go out and get them automatically. I mean, um, you can say that there will only be one answer to each of these things eventually, but I don't think that removes them from the design space now or indeed ever. It just means at some point we pick one space in the design space and disregard all others. But we're definitely not there, and it doesn't make it easy right. to, get there to pretend they're not a factor in the meanwhile. No, no, no. I mean, I think that like it is a valid concern that we are reserving this property and that we need to understand like all of the implications of reserving the property, right? Even if it's just at this, this higher layer. Um, but like w one of the reasons why 
I'm so right now the identifier is a string, and then we go to WebAssembly, it just becomes an object. That is specifically so that it just clobbers the old implementation essentially. That we we effectively like when we move on to the WebAssembly stuff, we're like just not doing any of this out of band shit anymore. Um, and it's a much kind of cleaner transition, and it doesn't require us to use any more additional namespaces or anything. Um, and that is like very intentional. Like that that is the even to the goal that we are like trying to get to. Um, and yeah, yeah, we we do need to consider sort of everything else. But like you know, like um, referencing, for instance, um, like the implementation selection stuff, that is literally just like the same resolution system as getting any other block data, as far as like, uh, yeah, like like that's just getting any other block data once we move into that. So right now, that word for referencing refers to not link loading or anything but um is for the where we have some rendezvous string that says like i am hamped right mm -hmm. it's, it's the part where you have some behavioral description of what's about to go on yes yes so so okay i i think i said that incorrectly right now it requ you requ we're requiring that the user configure something up front that helps you make that connection right so if you look at the current like generic library in JS, you um, say, oh, like, you know, I have an implementation that's of this particular string. That's the having Hold the on. referencing part. Well, so yeah, it's both, but like, so, so I guess what I'm trying to say is like, um, so need to pick a particular implementation, right? Or, like they're, they're, that is variable in the system that we have today, right? Where, okay, I got this string, now I need to figure out how I associate that string with an implementation. Um, and then I need to go and get the implementation, I need to have it around and have it configured. Those are like, those are tied together essentially as the same problem in the JS stack right now. Um, but I can see how they can be differentiated. <laughs> but, e but eventually we factor that out. Like that, that is not a thing, like that is one implementation of how to like do this thing that is referenced in the data structure period. Um, and if you wanted to change that behavior, what you would have to do is literally use a schema to mutate the data um, to say, no, use this other implementation. But then it would operate the same as if it had gotten that data up front. Didn't you switch to being the signaling problem halfway through that instead of the referencing problem? So the, the <laughs> So they're, they're all kind of connected, right? But um, I'm saying, say there is a signal already that we have the a signaling mechanism of some kind, whatever. Um, if you want to change it from the one that was configured in the self-description, right? So it self-describes that I am this thing. And if you wanted to change that, then you would use a schema to change that. But, but they're like, it, it is, what I'm saying is that it's static, right? The only way to mutate it is to like mutate the state of the actual data which means using a scheme in the future in the WebAssembly stuff. Like there, so, so here's what I'm saying. There is no API in the, like for you to say, hey, uh, here's like a WebAssembly data structure for this particular data thing. Like that's, no, it's part of the self-description period. If you want to mutate the self-description, fine. But like, that's the only way. Whereas like now, because we have to get these implementations out of band, like entirely, like I have to, I have to hand you my JavaScript implementation of every data structure um, in order for the system to work, like we, we have this problem in the interim. But that does get factored out. I don't think these things get easier to reason about by combining them or like saying they're not going to exist later. So like, okay, this is, this is sort of what I'm saying. Um, if we have a spec for how to run these WebAssembly functions, right? Um, and how to, how to do these operations on these data structures. If I have a path that doesn't use any of these data structures, but goes through multiple blocks, you are going to have to have some kind of resolution mechanism to go out and get those blocks, right? And, and traverse your way through the structure. 
if you support this generic system, you need an implementation of this engine that we're talking about that can run these WebAssembly functions and nothing else. Because everything that you would need in order to go and get all of the data to do these operations is attached to the data structure just like any other data. <laughs> what? So even if we have WebAssembly, which we don't, generally speaking, WebAssembly is still going to need tons and tons of interfaces for like the link loader interface will be something that we no. will have. No, it doesn't. It, do, it doesn't. it doesn't get a link loader at all. Then it gets I mean, network access and we run the no, entire... No, no, no. It doesn't get in. Like, no, no, like, like look at the JavaScript implementation now. Even the JavaScript implementation now of all these functions doesn't get a link loader. It doesn't get anything. Like it doesn't, like you, if it, if it wants more data, it has to basically pass back to the engine a reference to the data that it wants and then it gets that new data as a continuation into the same function. So it's like every function call is atomic to, to one decode. And that's like, it's designed that way so that we can just pop the WebAssembly stuff right in there. It's, it's, this, it's the same as I was talking about with my, the, my redesigning my hash map stuff is the, instead of, I will give you a way to get blocks. It's okay. You tell me, you, you traverse this single block. And if you need more, you have to come back to me and ask me. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how we avoid basically passing all of this extra implementation stuff into the WebAssembly function. Okay. Um, how did, so I've, I, I can't pop my own stack here. What problem will we solving with this? Like, I, I guess I believe that. I think whether or not there's a link loader interface that WebAssembly can call and whether or not it returns continuations is an implementation detail that I don't super care about. Either way, we need some specification of what those things are. And we will inevitably version that specification itself. Mm -hmm. so, so are we yeah. saying here, is this just is this discussion about, um, Eric, you think that there's these three distinct problems and Michael, you're saying that they essentially become the one problem in the, in the WebAssembly utopia? Yes. Is that, is that what this discussion is about? I mean, um, yes, and uh, um, the, the, the problem that Eric just referenced, which is like, we need a version of that spec. The, the version of the engine that you're using WebAssembly is also encoded in the data structure we talked about this function. So um, you, you, you basically need an implementation of that engine in order to do it, for sure, um, for that version of that spec. But that's all that you need. So I so still think all of this is embedded in somewhere between having the implementation and maybe the referencing part. Like interpreter versioning is somewhere down in having the implementation down. So th this, this is my point. If you have an implementation of the WebAssembly generics engine and none of the data structures, you can go and get any of the data structures and use them without, any, without the user, without the application developer ever configuring anything additional. But that like doesn't have to solve now. the problem of whether or not the application developer wants that for starters. Well, like, if they, so if they, if they don't want generic support, then they would not use a generic library. That is super oversimplifying and skipping a bunch of use cases. So remember one of our is we want to sometimes see through these advanced layouts and other times we don't. Like sometimes we want to like take the one path thing and then do all the internals and don't talk to me about it and then move on mm -hmm. because somebody's mm -hmm. giving us like a Unix FS path. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we actually do want to break out the abstraction inside and like yeah. get nitty gritty with it. Mm -hmm. So this still requires a signaling mechanism, which can allow us to say that we don't want the fancy pants behavior to occur. Can you repeat that, Eric? You're breaking up a bit. So for example, one of the things that we want to do is be able to use um, selectors, for example, on top of these things but conditionally, sometimes I might want a selector to say, give me this node. And like, let's say we're doing this over Unix FSB2. Mm -hmm. um, give me this node and everything underneath of it. And it would be like the file name is what I asked for. And then I just want the whole file. And I send a selector and it says, give me all of this. Mm -hmm. But something that we would like to do is also, let's say we're going to be good and cool for video streaming, which means we want like, functionally, we basically want the left leaning tree of the files internals first. So we might want to send somebody a selector that says that, 
So then it would have a bunch of path segments where it's going to use the fancy path stuff for the directories. And then when it gets to that file node, it decides not to use the abstraction anymore. And it explicitly asks for the leftmost leaning tree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, so, not, that's not that hard. Um, like, but, I, I do a bunch of stuff similar to that now. Um, but, but I think but that raises the point, though, that you still, you wouldn't, you can't use WebAssembly for that kind of thing if you're doing it more manually. So you need to fall back to some other solution, in which case you need to have signaling, referencing, having the implementation. You, you, you come back to those three distinct problems because you're outside of, you're outside of the WebAssembly utopia and you need to then go and fetch some other piece of code or use some other piece of code that says, I know how to traverse this particular thing. And what if that particular thing is of a slightly different version, all those sort of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, so let's back up just a little bit. One thing that's important to note is that the way that the system is built right now is that you do not perform operations on a path really. Like, um, you actually take like one root block and you perform an operation on it. And then that root block could end up doing a number of other operations, right? Within its data structure. So you may end up like actually doing a giant path lookup somewhere just to resolve the one thing you were trying to do. Um, and that's like, a, that's like a really important distinction because if what you wanna do is like uh, traverse like a you know like you were saying UnixFS to a file and then do something to that file like I, I do that now like in the UnixFS implementation like I say like hey give me this file and then when I get back it's basically like the, the the node implementation and then I say oh do operations on this like do reads out of it do stuff like that um, and if I wanted to replicate it I would literally like take <laughs> take that and say like hey replication structure like go and parse it and go, go replicate all the data underneath it. And then it would actually not pay any attention to the generic system. It would just like do straight up like the little linking stuff. Um, so that's all possible now because like the, where the, the implementation of the generic stuff lives is like at a pretty low layer where you're, you're just trying to perform an operation on something. And if you're constructing larger operations, you're actually like constructing them as multiple calls into that system. Um, so none of this is, is not possible. Um, the sort of like handing off between uh, path traversal at sort of layer one and layer two is a little tricky. Um, in particular, we have this issue now where, um, or we, we use this feature now, I should say, where um, a, because every operation can return like a target that is a path within itself, you have to interpret that path really interestingly, where you take the current decoded data and you traverse it basically at, at layer one until you break out of that block, until you hit another foreign reference. And then you're actually traversing like at that higher level because now you're performing operations back into the generic system. Um, and um, th I mean, the implementation works fine. It, it's not that tricky to implement, but it's a little tricky to talk about and understand. Um, but it's actually absolutely necessary to get the behavior that you, that you want to get when you're implementing one of these uh, generic. Um, so can, can yeah. I, can I, sorry, can I just mm -hmm. reinterpret yeah. what you're saying to see if I can get it right? Mm -hmm. You're saying that, that these concerns go away if you just make it so that the algorithms can be powerful enough to serve all these needs. So if, for example, we needed to, instead of doing a traversal that was, no, um, Okay, the, the way I'm, I think you're saying is like I, I, right now with the, the hash map stuff, you can get, a, get, you can perform a get operation, but you might want to do some, maybe there's a data structure where get is significantly more expensive than it has. Um, so, you know, you could either fall back to a manual looking through the blocks to do a has, or you just extend the algorithm so it also has a has operation. Um, you can do key, a keys operation to iterate over keys and an entries operation or a values operation. Um, I, think what, I think what I'm hearing, hearing you saying is that you, you, don't, you still don't have the problem that Eric is describing because you just beef up the algorithm to perform the tasks that you need it to perform in all these cases. 
And if you need to do syncing, then that's just a normal blocks plus, plus links syncing operation. Everything else yeah. goes through the algorithm. I mean, I, I guess I have one more question about that particular use case. So um, in, in this um, like imaginary data structure, like, like I, I imagine it's like a multi-block array of all of the, the data, right? Like to, to make this an actually like kind of complicated replication operation. So you want to go left to right on this, on this big array. Um, how are you discovering the, the layout and interpreting that layout in a way that corresponds to the actual like streaming read operation? Because you can describe the layout in schema and you can even describe an operation to do a read out of it that uh, programmatically understands the block structure. But I don't see how you would write generic code that um, understood any arbitrary multi-block data structure and could then figure out what a left to right read into that looks like, right? Yeah, so I think that part of the theory is operating on the idea that you would, like if you're going to choose to see the raw blocks, presumably it's because you think you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, th I have thought about this problem in, in terms of, um, I want to read this data out of a file, and then I want to know all the blocks that it took so that I can just replicate that. But, but this is like assuming that I actually have the block locally, um, or, or that I'm going to do the full read operation and then replicate what it took to do the operation. Um, and that's actually like why this is one of the reasons why everything is implemented as like this giant recursive generator that does everything and gives you a full trace because then you can actually see all the block lookups. So if I say, hey, go do this, do the read operation, and then like I can look at the trace and go, here were all the blocks. Okay, that's my replication set. Um, but I don't know how you would, yeah, figure out the replication set without just performing the entire operation, um, which, so what, what you would do in that case is that you would not send a selector over the wire to replicate. You would send a read operation over the wire and say, give me the replication set for it. Um, because the remote end already has the set and then they can figure it out quicker. If you did it locally, you would end up just like getting the blocks within the time. I mean, it would still be relatively efficient actually to do the read operation locally. Um, because like pretty quickly, you're gonna um, start actually streaming data out and then by that point, you're probably getting the blocks quicker than um, the user's getting them out. Yeah, some of that sort of checks out, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that we're, we're, we're heading for a situation where it's analogous to a standard library, standard library with collections in it and you almost never in these standard libraries would dig into the data structures in layout in memory layout underneath them you only deal with the interfaces and if the interfaces only give you certain powers that's all you get yep that's just bad luck some of them you can like in you know say c++ you could you can sort of i mean c++ is getting more difficult now but you could get through memory pointers and actually start to look inspect the memory than the way things are laid out but <laughs> mostly you just never would do that because you're either using an implementation that does what you need or you don't have, or you have to write your own essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where are we on the whole like conversational tree? So I think that um, we, we, you do have a set of, important concerns that I do want to capture about reserving the key, the key. And I want to figure out like what our methods to resolve in that as much as we can are, and if those are acceptable, or if we need to try to find some other method of self-description. Um, because there are like, I mean, I don't want to do this because there's another huge set of trade-offs, but we, we could literally say like, okay, in order to support generics, you need a codec that allows you to encode data that is, a, that is a transparent to the data model. It's like not in the data model. And that's where that lives, right? Like, 
I mean, if, if that's our only option, then that's our only option. Like, I don't want to do that, but um, we can explore that once we've ex exhausted sort of like our concerns if, they're, if we can remedy them. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, I think we've got a lot of other space that we can explore before that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I'm just saying, like, we, we have space to explore, but like, um, I think that the self-description stuff, like, I, I hope that now we're, we're somewhat aligned and like, we do need a method of self-description. Um, and it, it needs to live somewhere. And, and if it's in the data, if we're getting it out of the, the decoded block data, then that effectively means that we end up preserving some kind of key space. Um, I don't know if you saw my last Slack message, but I, I did realize that we can probably get out of having to reserve that key space anywhere in, a, in an object. So um, it would only be at the root, which means that you could very easily just implement a map generic that then could store that key very easily. Um, yeah, so that means that you can create maps that store that key. So, so that doesn't make me feel any better. When designing okay. the schema system, the schema system can, like this is a sort of as a compare contrast, mm -hmm. big setup, bear with me. Um, mm -hmm. The schema system can sit on top of the data model layer and the node interface at the data model layer for doing all sorts of these single step traversals and stuff. Mm -hmm. And the interface of a schema node are the same. They are exactly the same interface. So any code that has been written, which is generic over node at the data model is still generic and correct over node at the schema layer. The only thing that the schema layer does is add more logical rules and it will make more things return in errors. Mm -hmm. But the structure that you're programming against is completely identical. So, and, and as much as there's any more rules, it's basically the ones that you asked for. It's all intentional. So if we have a collections layer somewhere in between, which does all the shardy fun stuff and contains logic and so on, but it adds a rule like you can't use a key named foo, then that's not transparent to any of the higher layers anymore, right? If I create a construction that's like data model, some advanced layout stuff, and then some schema stuff, it, this doesn't have the same transparency throughout. There have been weird properties that I didn't necessarily ask for that accumulated. Okay. So like now if I want to put a map at the schema layer on top of an advanced collection that shards it on top of the data model, and some user wants to put a string called foo in it, mm -hmm. I have to do escaping at some point, right? or else just return an error, both of which are kind of awkward. Where does the escaping live? I don't know. Uh, wherever you add the advanced data layout stuff. But so now this stuff is become- So, so yeah, but like, in that case then, it, so you don't need a rule in the schema that says that you can't set that property. Except for in one, place, which is in the, the base kind. Um, for any other map, you should be able to set it. It's up to the implementation to decide how to store it and how to get it out, and if it needs to be escaped or not. So then ecosystemically, I don't know how this is going to work out, because we're going to have a whole bunch of the callbacks that can launch into advanced layout mode that are registered somewhere. Mm -hmm. And those start taking data that has the special name in it. And then they get triggered and then they go off and they go wild. So that means if somebody else who isn't using the generic system generated mm -hmm. data, the generic mm -hmm. system interpret it wrong, which seems ecosystemically murderous like absolute disaster well no i mean like if you mutate the data so wrong right so like if you if you mutate the data 
in a weird way, things will break. Like, it's just a matter of how they break and where they break, right? But what if my application, like, it's not breakage if I wasn't intending to use this layer. But now everybody else who's using these libraries has all of these things registered already globally, right? And this is, you see the problem. You know, I mean, for anything in the generic side of things, then you, you can set the, the key. It's fine. Unless there's a bug in the implementation. If there's a bug in the implementation, then that was like, again, it, it's, part, it's literally part of the data. <laughs> right. Okay, but generated data that isn't meant to be consumed with the generic system, let's say? Then, then it wouldn't be, right? But it actually contains the key. No, no, so, so like, how is the data being written into an IPLP graph? Some library that isn't using generics. Okay, well then generics will never... But then you read but it with it a library trying to use generics, because you're saying that's what everybody's going to do, right? Ecosystem-wide, people have mm -hmm. all these things registered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that means so, the So this the would be... This, so, okay, okay, okay. I, I see what you're saying. So this would be problematic. This would be problematic in the case that someone encoded data to slash... Sorry, so someone in a single block would have to encode data into a slash key that was an object that had a type property. That's what they would have to do. The length of the conditional chain there matters. The fact that the conditional chain exists is black. No, no, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to quantify this. So um, it would have to be a set of data in a single block and it would have to be in this property in a particular way. Um, also like keep in mind that they're, if they put a string there for slash right now, it already breaks. Only in DAG JSON, which is not our yeah. data. Like this is super yeah. important. I have um, and not use DAG JSON. They will break in DAG JSON, but they're fine in DAG C. Okay. Right. Um, so anyway, so it's slash, then an object, then a type property would be how it would break. Um, Yeah, and then they would have to read the data with a library that's quite generic. And they would get an error, yeah. Yeah, which is something we're saying that the ecosystem will tend to do, which sounds like then a problem. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, they'll use those libraries to read it. We should just add, add lots of punctuation to our signaling mechanism then, so that it's less likely that people will use it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the thing uh, about Slash that is nice well, is that it's already it. somewhat transparent. Like, there are a bunch, of, like, there's code all over the place that will just miss that data. Um, in fact, like, even if we cleaned up all of our code to be able to, to read the data, we have, like, all the code in the ecosystem would have to, and all of their, their pathing stuff would also have to support it. Like, it's, it's just incredibly problematic to encode data into that key. Um, like in general, um, all all of the things that have mm. problems with slash are DAG JSON, and like no 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 I, the, no no there's the, no no I, I already told you like literally all of the those are all codecs, bugs. all all the codecs like in in JS won't see if you use the readers at the block level to read the data rather than decoding the full block data it's effectively invisible. So I think if you circulate that around as many other people as possible, the general conception once they figure out what you're talking about is that this is a bug. Like these are two fix. So, so I'm, I feel like I'm out of sync here. Have we, is this discussion about replacing the current underscore type with yeah. slash type? Yeah, I mean, I'm already sort of convinced that we should move it because like, I, I think that, we're less likely to have stuff encoded into a slash key than, than we are into underscore type. Um, so it's a, and, and because it's already problematic in a number of ways, it's, I would like to just keep that as a namespace where we reserve things. If we're going to reserve a key inside of the data, which we may not do. Um, but like, then you need to propose something else that is within the data that actually gets encoded in the block somewhere, even if it's transparent to the block data in order to do the self-description. Like we need another option.
Oh, how, so is, how are we going to deal with that in JSON slash type? In JSON, we literally have no other option. Uh, like if we, if we actually want the block to be valid JSON and not um, some kind of specialized format, we, we literally have no other option. So. Right. So I think what this comes down to, and something that maybe hasn't been sufficiently explicitly discussed, but remember we have that distinction between like codecs that are native and actually contain the whole data model and ones that aren't. DAG JSON is an art. So we basically have That's one crazy. codec that it is. Yes. That's no, we can't. No, 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 no. Like you can't normalize everything to to seaboard. Like if if this is problematic in JSON, it's probably problematic in other sets as well. Like that may well be true, but like seriously, it's DAG JSON is not an IPLD native codec. No, no, th this is like. If, if, if JSON doesn't work and there's no way to encode it in the valid JSON, then the IPLD data model is, is fucked. Like, we, we can't say, like, the most popular encoding mechanism on the planet just has no way to encode this data that's valid. Like, that's crazy. Um, like, there, I mean, I, I already went down the path of, like, potentially not actually using JSON in big JSON and encoding into something else that did binary a little bit better. And the place that you end up at is, like, oh, actually, the reason why you want the blocks in JSON is is not like just like readability it's because there are a huge number of apis out there cloud and otherwise that will just only take json data um and like literally sending them binary data like it gets all of it gets base 64 in any way so it's it's actually just better to send that json back and forth um like that's the that's the the, the main utility of having it um i completely buy all the utility and i want to use json as much mm -hmm. as possible i am a fan but it is not an IPLD native codec. And it doesn't matter how much we want it. The point of the data model is to define the, I'm gonna use the C word, Rod, mm -hmm. is to define the cardinality and the set of things that are representable and that we can talk about in general. And all of the mm -hmm. other codecs are like, this is a, a hub and spike thing. Okay, but the, if this stuff isn't practically usable, then it's just, and just academically pure, then it's effectively useless. So, like, we, I mean, it, it's it's fine that like to, to point out these problems, but if there isn't a resolution, then the we solution already, is actually to change the spec. We already have the case that bytes don't go smooth to JAG JSON, right? Well, they but they they are valid. They work. They encode back and forth just fine. How do they get decoded? What signals bytes to decode into? It's the it's base sixty four. What if I have a base 64 string? No, no, it, it doesn't just look at every string. It, it uses the slash keyword and, and puts <laughs> the, the base 64 in there in an object. Or other So writer. it's distinguishable. Not a length. No, no. no, 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 no. So, so there's, there's no byte array support at the moment. But, um, no. there, but there is space for it. It is not an IPLD native codec, and it never has been. No, no, it's, it's <laughs> like what the, what the spec says is that you have to be able to take these particular types, encode them and decode them and not have any loss in between. And like you can take any arbitrary binary data and send it to the JSON codec and get it back. But you can't, so you, you can construct a data structure that conflicts with that though, that has the same shape as the escaping mechanism that JSON uses to determine. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. you, you, you could, and the same problem with link. Because link is also encoded into that into that keyword in an object. Yeah, no, and I, I look. I, I think if we if we're backing ourselves into a corner where DAG Seaboard is the only option, then we're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, and and I, yeah. this seems to me like the reason. This is the reason why the IPLD data model is not really is not super spe specific. In fact, it's extremely vague. Integers, yeah. strings, <laughs> strings, <laughs> links. Oh, they're, they're, no. There is some language in there that like you need to not uh, fuck up basic, like uh, in 64. <laughs> there, there is some language in there specific about that, which actually JSON is fine with. It's actually JavaScript that fucks up 64-bit uh, integers. Yeah. I mean, but like, yeah, I mean, like, like literally, like if you don't have a solution to this problem, then the solution is to change the spec. Like, and to just say like, okay, now we're just reserving it in the spec of the data model layer because like there, there has to be some way to accomplish this in common encoding formats or else we're, we're, there's no point in even having a data model. 
we just say everything needs to be in the specific implementation of DAG Cbor with tagging. Okay, so, so it, it, I, it I feels like a track. Infinity. Yeah. What? All codecs can bidirectionally losslessly map to all other codecs. This is a fundamental truth of the universe. If one codec ever mm -hmm. can express one more bit of entropy than another codec, then they are not equal. And the bigger one can contain all of the data from the smaller one, but not vice versa. Yes. OK. So then the like literally, I mean, kind of another solution to this problem is to update the spec and say that slash is observed, and then have DAG Seaboard throw. That, that would solve this problem as well. It would reduce, it would improve the cardinality between the implementations and solve the problem. I'm not above reserving it everywhere. I don't care. If that's the only way to resolve it. So that, okay. So we're like, we're miles deep on this decision tree where we're reserving <laughs> things again. And like, there's this whole other universe of decision tree where this is just not an issue that we have. And I want to go there, over there. I want to give that at least oh. conversation time and we are not. Okay, like, we need a method of self-description for this feature. We, we can get into the... I don't the, know what the that word means, but it seems to involve you jumping into the part of the tree that's sad and then ignoring the other part of the tree. Okay, <laughs> okay. When I look at it, when I get block data, uh, I need to know about the generic that, that it needs in order to interpret the data. What if we have some context? That tells us that. No, it has to be in the data. What if we have that? that like, I, yeah. What? Sorry, I you have, cut out for a second. What if we have fat pointers? So you want to extend the link? I mean, but it's in the data. Link that has been floated before. Yeah. So the point is that self-description doesn't necessarily jump us even all the way to that it in So the, the, the problem with doing it at the pointer level is that you, you potentially make the pointer fucking gigantic. Um, because like, if you're talking about the WebAssembly description, like it's, it's very large. Um, that's why it's nice to have it just in the root block um, rather than in every pointer. Too. Um, so, it's not just a string, right? Like it's it's not going to be just a string. Like that's a stopgap. Again, like we we want to get past that. Um, and it's not just a hex value. Like it's a, it's a fairly co like eventually it's a fairly complicated description. And a fat pointer breaks the self-describing data thing quite badly. No. Well, no, not necessarily because like we, it's the same thing with a CID, right? Like the CID um, tells you the codec to interpret, but it's in the pointer to the data, not in the block data itself, right? Like the block data for dig JSON does not say, hey, I'm dig JSON. It literally is in the reference to it. Right, you're right. But again, like now we're back to literally like either revving the data model or saying that we have a new set of codecs to support it because this is a extension of the link type that that is no that is not currently there so i just don't have any I don't, there, to my knowledge, there are no hard problems whatsoever if we say that signaling is something that we do with schemas or some other layer like that. Here's the problem. I need to be able to link to your data without having the application configured for how to interpret the data. But so yes, that could happen in a fat pointer and it could happen in the block data, but it, but it cannot be like an out of band schema that gets applied. So a bunch of this reminds me of a, one of the discussions I had with somebody at DTN, mm -hmm. where he was asking about how do we interpret some data? Let's say I have a number, and it's going to mean temperature, but I don't know what kind. So maybe I'll put a C or an F with it, right? Mm -hmm. And then if 
but then how do I know that that means temperature C? What if it means like credits in some monetary system that I've never heard of before? Mm -hmm. And the answer to that is, well, then you look at the bigger context. Like, is this in a field in a bigger object that's called temperature? Well, then it's probably temperature, right? Looking at the context a little bit further out is how the problem is resolved. And this is like, you can think about this for a really, really long time and you'll get into information theory town and be like, no, yeah. no, but th this is just, this is wildly more complicated than what, than what we have now. Like, um, like right now we have like relatively simple operations that you can perform on targets. So like even adding a fat pointer to that means that like I either have to inject the data for how to interpret it or um, like I, as I traverse through, I pass that along. Um, saying that like there's some wider context for the graph that I then use to figure out the generic implementation, like that's not reasonable. Um, so I mean, I we, have, we, have to, we, have, we literally have to think about data structures that are the size of the internet that, that are like, like linking to other people's websites. Like that is the size and scope that we're looking at. We, we can't rely on like that much kind of shared state to figure out what's going on. The thing about context what? is it has to be a jump to like the root of the universe and all knowledge, right? Like you can do this iteratively. And this actually so is, is Go for it. Um, sorry, Eric. I, I just feel like I need to catch up here. What, what, where is the schema in this universe that you're speaking about? Where is it located? Because it still needs a place and a signal to get there. So the funny thing is, I don't care. It's just one layer out from wherever you are. So you keep so it at hand, and you sort of like navigate the two trees in parallel. So it seems. It seems to me that. It, isn't that basically the same thing as what Michael's doing where the root block is the special thing? It's, it's one layer out from most of the data. You're just wanting to push it yet another layer out. Cause if it's in the root block, it's, it's a place. You, you just know, want I, to make it a place that's separate from that. I think that Eric is proposing that the two things are applied in parallel. So you have the graph of data and you have the schema for the data and the application is applying them. And I'm like, I don't think like that isn't reasonable. That doesn't give us data searches that stretch the internet because you're not going to like have a schema for like that much data. It, like the, the data, like once you start traversing through like, the data, you this. should assume, no, uh, uh, you, we need to assume that the data that you parse through in a path is relatively unpredictable. And we need to resolve just in code automatically in the engine. This is, this is why I like don't like the JavaScript from one of the WebAssembly stuff. Um, we need to be able to resolve all of this just automatically for a user, because without that, then then we're essentially in like you know, th this is like like Go's package manager versus JavaScript, right? Where like Go is like no, just install and manage every package by hand. That is the solution to this problem. And in JavaScript, you say like, oh, I installed this thing and it has a tons of, of dependencies and they're all conflicting, but somehow this shit just runs. <laughs> um, and like, we need the case where it just runs. Like I need to be able to, if I'm not able to freely link to other people's data without people who use my data having to configure some crazy thing or potentially deal with, with this piece of their added information, people just won't do it. They just won't be linking to other people's data the way that they link to other people's websites. It's not a zero cost activity that way. But, so like, I acknowledge all that and I'm still not seeing the problem here. We have two different, we have, well, okay, we probably have several different user stories for what links and traverses you have to do. But one of them is replication and that needs to work at the scale of the internet and infinity terabytes mm -hmm. without advanced knowledge. But it already yeah, that, those links are at the data model layer, right? So replication yeah. just that layer. Yeah. yeah. And as far as linking, if if somebody is writing a web page, and so like the mental context here is I'm reading a markup document, and there's a link in it to some totally different data structure, which has very not a web page semantics, then I probably do want that link to come with some sort of description of what's going to go on over there. So anytime you change context, you attach the context hint, right? And then you I still don't see the dis distinction between pushing that down to the root block. Because it's the same thing. Doing that. So then I can like give you a schema to my web page which says, by the way, I'm going to have something that looks like a link here, and that link is going to go to this other totally different kind of document. And you just keep doing this. 
So this actually composes all the way up, and at no point do you need a reserved word. But so, so then at the very top, you need to be able to say, when you go down five layers across five different companies' data, you will be encountering all of these things. And here's all of the things that you will be encountering along the way. Every time you're doing one of the hardcore jumps, this is like a context jump where you need a new schema for what you're jumping into, then that information is locally resolved and held there. Right. How? This because again, this sounds like it embedding it in the root block, but at a, at a block lot higher. Is it reserving something to embed it? But it can be reserved. It can be reserved in a different way in the higher layer. This is not a good use of the word reserved. So I mean, like, th there's. I see what you're saying. I see how you could potentially apply them. So you would you would write all of this into the link essentially. Um, there's, there's a bunch of problems with it. Like, for one thing, um, you, you, you have like a, you have potential mutations that are deep from higher up in the tree. So if you try to perform the same operation from a leaf node, you, you get different behavior than if you performed it as part of a one. Um, and so you, it, it really like invalidates some of the, what you would think of as immutability guarantees. Um, because, because like when I, when I, <laughs> when I have this subtree and when I have this bigger tree, if I perform an operation here, I perform it on a path from here to here and it's the same thing, I should get the same thing back. But this would allow you to mutate that because you'd be able to apply these schemas like as you traverse your way down. Um, I, like that's, that, that's very problematic. Don't um, think that's a problem slash I'm confused. Because you're, you're talking about like, this is just like a lot of information and context to, to pass over and then a lot of hazards as you work your way down. Um, and also like who, who wins? So like if I link to somebody and I say, here's a schema um, and, that, and that's deep and it talks about the schema deep and then when I traverse into the tree, it says something else, who do I believe? Um, like either you're gonna say the root most always wins because they're the last person who links to it. So effectively the last right um, but then you get different behavior if you perform an operation with different tree contexts. Um, that, yes, but that sounds like you're worrying about solving mutable. Also, like, like if, if I, if I see your data and I get your data and then I want to link to it, um, I now need, an, I don't just need the information about the data. I need information about the link that got me there. Um, so we, like every system that, that uses this is going to have to keep around like this incredibly large reference. It's not just going to be a CID, it's going to be like, like a lot more data um, in order to, 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 you know, link practically to other people's data. Um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty big departure from not just how we've done links so far, but also just in, in how we've constructed all of our libraries in this, I don't know a single place where an operation on a subtree or on a larger tree that just traverses into that subtree actually has variances in behavior. Um, um, in codec, changing codec is your yes. variance. No, no, no. But that would—that's a different reference. Like that's literally not part of the same tree. So no, no, no. So, so like if, if I if I swap out a reference from, from raw to Seaboard, that's not a traversable path anymore. <laughs> like it just it ends. <laughs> or if I if I change the codec and it's invalid, then it actually literally throws right. Like that you you can't. There are cases where where you can change it and then just make it fail, um, but there aren't cases where a path with several layers deep and a and a shorter path that are both valid to the same data structure and performing the same operation would differ right now. The path would actually be, it would break as soon as you change the codec and any of those links in between. Yeah. It would, like because of numerical properties, but like. I mean, it wouldn't actually work, right? Like we're not, <laughs> we can't talk about preserving behavior that actually doesn't function. Um, you think? 
I think the codex are very much in an instance of this. Yeah. Codec There's a lot of things about this that I don't like. Um, based on the codec information in the link, we figure out how to interpret further links deeper in, and that's how it goes. When we heap application level semantics on it, so if we want to like, let's put the codecs back down, and we want to talk about like how Unix best stuff works in practice right now. The I think we still kind of de facto have this structure, like when a path comes in from the gateway APIs, it is contextual information from how that path came in that we are expecting to resolve it against the Unix FS v1 specs right now. And that's just de facto how everything works. We lost him. Does this keep recording when somebody drops? It says that you're recording it now because you're the host. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, cloud, it's, it's cloud recording, so yeah. Right. I feel like there's I, I, one of the problems with taking notes for this is that there's a lot of context that's in Slack from you and Michael having a long discussion, and I don't feel like I'm capturing the essence of it because I don't feel like I fully even understand it. I think we're rehabbing most of that discussion, to be honest, for better or for worse. Michael and I have tried to have much of this discussion before in in person a couple of days ago as well, and I'm not sure it had any clearer resolution other than there are issues here. Well, okay, I, I, it, I'm not convinced that you are even talking about the same, quite the same thing. So. I think one of the other problems we have is that Michael just wants to get stuff done now. And if we keep on going down schemas and all this, this other stuff, we end up creating a large stack of things for ourselves to fix just to get things done now. Right. I don't know if that's what's driving all of his objections right now, but it seems to me that that's a, an overriding priority. And that makes sense, but I want to, so if we can pivot, where I'm trying to get is if we can pivot the signaling design to a choice between like the de facto nonsense we have now versus something explicit that might be based on schemas but doesn't matter, it just has to be explicit and like parallel traversal powered versus the in-band thing. Like we can also carry on the explicit parallel traversal powered thing without technically blocking it with schemas. And we can get a bunch of code written with the de facto signaling stuff as well. Even. So this is this is what I'm, try, I'm still trying to get my head around what you're, the way you're both describing the things that are in your head. To me, it seems like what you're talking about is analogous to in HTML when you reference things, you might say href. This is a a href, which is a this is another page that you can load versus an image tag or a link tag for a CSS thing or a script tag. So the context is in the link. Go over there and get this thing, but it's for this purpose, so you should interpret it in this way. Yeah, I guess that checks out. Sorry, can you say that again? You just broke up. Yeah, I guess that checks out. Whereas Michael wants it to be in the thing that you fetch. So it's like the mime type, which is not really in the thing, but it's close enough to the thing. Or a, a, a file extension, .js. This is a script file. Mm -hmm. Or a PNG. Right, so I don't think self-description is bad, but I think having it be built in and the spec require that it trigger action would be insane. Like, imagine if we had a file system where if something had a .jpg extension, you were not allowed to open it with a plain text editor. That would not be something you'd want to do often, but also it would be truly bizarre if you couldn't choose to do it, right? But but, but is, this is not about 
not being able to make that choice though, because that can be done at a at an interface level. You can your API can you can give it some sort of signal like read this thing raw. That's pretty common. Like in the the jQuery um, metaphor that we're sort of talking about on JavaScript side, where you interpret the DOM through this jQuery lens and you get back these jQuery things that are representative of this underlying ugliness. But you can always choose to break out of that and deal with the raw stuff if you really want to. I think that's the choice of the library to provide those points where the user can go down a level. But the default, right. the default is just, it works. But then if, if we were in JQ land, imagine if JQ had some concept of escaping. I don't know. So like what happens in JQ when, when you want to access a map with the key of slash? For starters, it works, right? <laughs> and I'm afraid this proposal of reserved keys is going to cause that to not be true. And I don't actually understand any concrete proposal for action here that doesn't cause that failure. If I have to provide some opt out signaling mechanism in order to be safe for special characters, we could build a system that complex, but I don't really want to, right? Because then we have the entire need for explicit out of band signaling anyway, like it's a requirement for the system to function correctly in the presence of some keys in user data. And we made it in like the most likely to fail unsafe mechanism possible. So given that we need some explicit signaling, let's choose the use case such that we're safe for our very user data first and then do the fancy thing second. Okay, okay. So your, your primary concern here is that conflict or the, the, the no escape from the conflict situation. And I'm just, so Michael's tried to say that we, if I understand him correctly, that using at a higher level of library usage, that we will be able to do that conflict resolution there. But to me, that is, like, so it's, you can't ignore the signaling problem. That is the choice of signaling problem solution. That's the choice of de facto in this gist that's linked. That's where you choose at the library layer. So we're not avoiding the problem category. And yeah, like de facto is just not the best solution. So if our, if our fallback is that anyway, I, I feel like we just give that is the hard path through all this. But so why is, if you're talking about fat pointers essentially or providing that context. That's another thing to build though. So isn't that just like you're, you're choosing, is that your lesser of two evils? Is that what this is? I didn't want to concretely suggest those. I just felt but, like I but what, well, what else is there though? It's like, go over here and get this thing, but it's going to be this type of thing. Like what, what is that mechanism that says this is the thing that you're going to? Because here's, here's a structure that I'm imagining a lot of. It, say you've got a, a hash map and the at the values of the hash map are links to other data structures so um like in this uh, i don't know if you saw the discussion with me and tim about the um the lua package manager stuff mm -hmm. where the hash map would serve as a really good secondary index but the secondary index is going to point to pieces in the primary index and they themselves are going to be data structures so you, and, and then you might have indexes upon indexes, but it's a legitimate thing too. Mm -hmm. um, and so you need to jump around. So you need to encode something that says, when you go over there, it's gonna be this type of thing. And you either need to pull that up to the very top layer of your traversal, or you need to have it in, store it in your hash map somewhere, in the values somewhere, as a key of something that says something. Um, hang on, I'm gonna try not to disconnect us or throw the device, but it'll plug in a charger. <laughs> um, 
Um, yeah, so I didn't want to suggest fat pointers concretely because I think this is indeed a thing where it should be like user salt to taste. Um, it's, it's, so like with that example of the temperature system, if you have enough local context already that you're pretty damn sure you're talking about temperature, then saying the word temperature repeatedly or like spelling out Celsius instead of just C or some other indicator becomes unnecessary because there's enough informational entropy that's come with you this far that you, you know that now. I, I don't know about that. I, I don't know if that's a great, a great um, example because there are so many situations in, in the real world where that assumption is made and you get to that end point and you say, okay, hang on, what were the assumptions that were made and are they valid? And are, are there conflicting assumptions that we brought with us so that we're at this point with non-self-describing data then we have to rely on the assumptions or the context that we got here, but that context is still not enough in some way because it's, it's either self-conflicting or we've lost it or we're just unsure. We, we don't have the high confidence in it, basically. If it were up to me, I would, I would put Celsius and Fahrenheit with every temperature measurement, just like I would put, um, you know, the currency with every dollar measurement and the, I would order dates in a very particular way to be very explicit because US dates drive me mad. Those kinds of things you need, that context isn't enough. Bi-weekly isn't enough. It's not enough to tell me your meeting is bi-weekly because I might show up twice a week. Are you American or are you like, so this is all true, but imagine you've got some document where you have thousands of temperature measurements or something, right? Right. You label each one of them as schema.tld slash the universal specification slash v2019 slash uh, a very long random UUID slash temperature slash optional slash extension well, now you're slash just being the Celsius. Truth. But, you know, right, such a universal, universal qualification could be constructed, but then should we really use that for every number that follows? No, like maybe you attach that label somewhere a bit higher up, and now it's implied for the rest. And why not both? If we require ourselves to do it super explicitly at every occurrence, we require data to be really big. And but but is but is Michael saying that we're requiring it, or that this is the path we're choosing for least resistance today? I, I don't know the answer to that. But is are you getting the impression that he's saying this is a requirement and there's no alternative? Even if it is trying to be a path of least resistance thing, I don't. I think that's a false choice. Like if it involves, or like this is just a concept that I call ASCII fucking because you shouldn't do it. <laughs> Like, hello, welcome back. <laughs> hey, your audio's off, Michael. You're on mute. I had actually given up entirely on that. Um, I don't know what happened, but like, I couldn't send any Slack messages, and I was also still online. I didn't understand it. Anyway, um, okay, hold on. Let me do my headphones. Back. I blame IPv6. <laughs> <laughs> Real talk, I have a weird issue where one of my I'll apps on the phone crashes mm -hmm. constantly on this particular Wi-Fi in the house I'm in right now. I'm because pretty sure it's six? a problem. <laughs> it's impressive that uh, IPv6 works enough to break things. Um. <laughs> <True. laughs> yeah, I, I was really curious for the longest time, and then I realized, oh, yeah, this network that I'm in in this house right now is unique. The network's all plugged if I've been in it is end to end IPv6. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so one other thing that um, doing it as a link, as a fat link that I realized would be problematic, the publishing and subscribe flow gets really fucking complicated because all of a sudden you can't just publish a CID. You have to publish a CID and all the information about it because you would have to, you would want that information to potentially be updated if you updated the data structure that it was associated with. So everybody linking to it now has to like subscribe to get all of that input together. And they can't just subscribe to a CID that then describes it because then we would again need the reserve space. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, that seems like table stakes yeah. to me, one way or the other. So, but that would then that would force your the rigidity of your migration path all the way up the chain. So, if you built a a, a Slack, mm -hmm. and then every channel had a certain data structure that linked into every user's feed, which had its own data structure, and that the top level had another data structure. If you wanted to migrate to a new version of some data structure down deeper, you would have to force that migration all the way to the top of the stack. You couldn't just do it down a piece and have it done in that piece. Hamp, Hamp to version one, and now it's Hamp version two because it's faster and better. You then have to say all the way up the top. Yeah, we use Hamp version two is down the bottom there. Yeah. yeah, that's something you do like remarkable structures. Your updates. Probably. No, I. And no, but like you, you, you're taking information of like, this is not information about the link to the data. It is literally information about the data. Like it, it, like that structure is not like really interpretable functionally without that data associated with it. You, you want it as part of the content address. Like you, you literally want the hash to change when you change the imp implementation. Um, okay, so I agree with that. And I'm gonna go back to the three original separations. That is mm -hmm. the referencing problem. And I definitely want that in there. I agree with that completely. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I have a stick <clears throat> in my posterior about is that the sheer existence of something that looks like it might be a reference cannot be enough to change behavior alone because then I have problems where I have to opt back out of that in special cases. Like referencing should be in band signaling is different. Wait, so reference is in band signal is not. When you're talking about them both being in band, what's the differentiation there? I think signal being in band basically mean, I think that actually does jump to needing a reserved word and that's why I don't like it. In band. But how would you, but how would you do a ref, how would you do an in band reference though without a keyword. Well, that, uh, that's fine. So referen referencing refers to that thing where you have a string that's like experimental slash IPLB slash ham slash v1. Yeah, yeah, but like how do you differentiate that from any other like so the like how do you put that in how do you put that into the data structure without a reserved key is my question. So whether or not it's a reserved key is the signaling problem what that string contains and how we work with it is the referencing problem. That's just the problem definition. Does the problem, does that part even at least follow? All right, bro, I'm gonna run out of battery sometime, not too far from now. Yeah, I also think that like, I keep using this word reserved, but like reserved means a couple different things and um, even the way that I'm looking at it now, it's like, it's not, I don't know. Um, yeah, I think a way to look at it might be trying to figure out where concretely, like in an implementation, the long jump is going to be the if clause for this. Mm -hmm. And then just, I don't know, figure out where that's going to be. Because every time I try to figure out where that's going to be, it's in a pretty scary place. Yeah, well, okay, so we'll learn more about that the more that we move down the road of just doing the implementations, though, and building on top of it. So I'm not too worried about that part. Um, for now, I'm just going to move it to slash because then at least we're, we're putting all of our problems into one place um, <laughs> and then having them spread around. <laughs> um, Um, since fat links got, or fat pointers got mentions, I want to re-mention that and like back out from it a little bit. And I wanted to just mention that as like an example of something else that was at some point proposed. I don't necessarily particularly like that one. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes fat pointers might be my preferred suggestion. Like sometimes you have enough context because you already have followed a fat pointer sometime recently. Mm -hmm. And can we? 
I wonder if maybe the, the most productive outcome here is to draw a line under this today and come back to another meeting later in the week um, and do it again because I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think this will wait mm -hmm. two weeks. And, and I don't think that doing it one-on-one -on -one is the greatest answer either, so. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't agree that it's something that we have to get resolved right away. I mean, everything that we're working on is highly experimental and, and, and highly, like, and we're, we learn more the more that we do it. And none of this is stuff that we can't back out of later. Um, I mean, we can't back I, out I, of it I, I six agree. months from now, but we, we can certainly back out in a few weeks. Um, and and being just, like, I just, I'm in Barcelona next week anyway, so it's going to be hard okay. to talk about. I mean, I can talk with Eric about it. <laughs> but, my my concern is more is not about getting to a final answer. It's about being talking about precisely the same thing, and I'm just not yeah. convinced that's happening. Um, okay. Also, by the way, I'm like, I'm not that opposed to just having an out of band, like saying the codecs have to have some way of encoding out of band metadata. Um, because we I can do that with JSON too. Um, we could even just update Jake JSON, say fuck it. Um, like I could literally just say like, okay, Jake JSON is actually a JSON object with two properties. One is called data, one is called meta, and the meta acts like an overlay on the regular data. So then we don't have any reserved keywords, and I just like have all the meta information about how to layer that on the data structure when it comes out of the decoder, right? So you can encode that in real in raw JSON. It's not a problem. But then you can't, then IPLD can't read other people's JSON that wasn't written with IPLD. Which well, was the, one of the kind of nice things. Well, it, it would if you run it through the block, right? Because you're not doing this by hand. The, the, block in, the, the block encode and decode is doing it for you. So you just pass a regular fucking object to block decoder and you get back a regular object out of it. There's nothing special. So I would actually say again that you already can't read other people's data with DAG JSON. Like you cannot take a repeater formula in my docs for how to use the timeless stack and parse it with DAG JSON because it contains a map for file systems and one of the keys, flash, and sometimes people only have that input file system. So it does not parse as DAG JSON, which mm. kind of sucks. But something we could do is have another JSON codec that doesn't have that same link signal. And then we could use some like other raw. Right. Well, on a, well I, we actually already have that. So there's already a just JSON um, encoder that doesn't have link types or binary in it. So it's um, not DAG JSON, it's just JSON. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, honestly, we don't, have an, we don't have enough data encoded into J DAG JSON that we couldn't just change it still. Like, we, we don't have a, it's not enabled anywhere in production, like that I know of. It's not, it's not yeah. enabled in IPFS. It's, it's, uh, it's not enabled in IPFS. Right. There's no JSON in the multi-codec table, by the way. There's only data Sorry, what? what? What was that? Uh, Radical is using it. Radical is using it. Which implementation? Go, I think. I'm not sure. Okay, I don't even know how the Go implementation works, to be honest. Like, the, the, like it, it probably doesn't support binary. It probably predates our binary support. I also actually don't know how that works. Um, yeah. Um, there's there's no there's no non DAG JSON. It's just JSON in the codec table. Sorry, this it's just DAG JSON. No other JSON in there. Uh, it's not in. It's not in. It's not a codec. It's um. It's like a multi format. I'm in the multi-formats table and there's, I'm searching for JSON. There's only one entry. Okay. Maybe I was thinking of BSON or something. Is BSON in there? <laughs> Whatever. Um, so for these in context, one of the other things that Stabalian has proposed at some point is we should make a... It's Seaball. There's DAG Seaball and Seaball. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Stabalian has proposed a DAG JSON harder or something like that. <laughs> my name invention. That's my can laugh at me again. Um, in which everything would be serialized to roughly double the tree depth. We would just use each alternating layer of tree depth to say whether or not this thing is a link or bytes, which are the things that are otherwise hard to represent. Such a codec would be IPLD native 
in that we could put any information mm -hmm. into it and it would be bidirectional lossless. That doesn't necessarily mean it's ergonomic for existing, for interacting with other people's JSON. But those mm -hmm. are two different properties. Oh, shit. No, I have an upgrade path. It's fine. I can support all this in the same thing. We already break the slash keyword in JSON, so we can just put information about the version of JSON into the slash keyword and then uh, vary behavior. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I'm not doing that thing that Steve wants to do. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I thought about something very similar actually once um, when I was trying to figure out some of the other binary encoding stuff. And yeah, it's, it's too much. Like, it's easier to just create an overlay object and then overlay the data on top of it when you do the interpretation. And then you don't end up with, with doubled size. You end up with just like a tiny bit more size. You end up with like, like you end up with, 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 with like an array of the key path as like the extra space that you're taking, basically. But that doesn't make it transparently work with somebody else's stuff. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's draw Okay, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, let's pull into that. But yeah, I'm, I mean, if we, if in order to use generics, you, you have to be able to encode some other out of band information, um, or other information that's transparent to the data model, that's fine. If you basically just need to be able to, to store literally like the generic info somewhere that is not visible through the data model decode. It would change the block APIs. It would violate some of the separations and the layers that we've been talking about. But it, if that's what we have to do, is what we have to do. I'm not opposed to it. All right, I got one. Okay. And cool. Battery. Cool. All right. Bye.